What's up guys, this is Cher talking. welcome back to my channel. On today's video, I'll be making a full review for the Robunsen Festival Julian banner that brings Julian a uh, cover tank with revenge damage, then Thomas, a uh, damage dealer with also support versus blunt and pierce damage. Sarah, a uh, damage dealer with help of guard up and heals. And Ellen, a uh, damage dealer with access to good debuffs. Well, we're gonna start talking about Julian because he gives a name to the banner. He has very good status distribution, to be honest. 115% STR, endurance, and will. Well, the endurance and will values are very big for a tank. He has very low agility, and it's actually very good to have low agility with this character because he wants to attack after the boss. He starts uh, the fight with the MVP, but gets one extra when he lands an attack. When he is hit by a direct attack, he will grant himself the defense boost that increases damage taken by 20%, lasts for 2 turns and stacks, and he will also grant all enemies a slash and pierce defense down that will decrease the defenses of each by 10%. If you use a skill that have both slash and pierce, you can take both effects and it will increase the damage for more values. But this can also help any other character in the party as well that do slash or pierce damage. Now, when he is attacked by an indirect attack, you grant himself this attack boost that increases his damage potential by 20%, lasts for two turns, this can stack, and he will also grant himself this chance to revenge that lasts for just that particular turn. Chance to revenge, it's a chase attack that will use flash triple trust, that is a double S power attack with slash and pierce. This is an attack that has very close power to triple S, and since it has double element, it's nice. Have coverage for two types, and these are the two types that he can also apply defense down. When an ally is attacked, he has a 37% chance to take this ally place and reduce the damage and over. That means that, for example, if there is an AoE attack, 37% of the time, only four characters will be hit. He will protect one from damage, but if it's single target attack, can also cover, but if you're using him correctly, most of the attacks will also be directed towards Julian anyway, but he still has a chance to protect someone. When he is attacked, he will also be buffing all surviving allies, endurance, will, and charisma by 5%. Here, it doesn't matter if he's being attacked by a direct or an indirect attack. He then decreases damage taken at all times by 50%. Now, the first skill Soaring Blade plus a single target slash and pierce damage, and when the attack lands, it will grant the target slash and pierce defense down. This time you can reach 15% debuff, lasts for two turns. So you can actually stack with the other passive that you can see here. And you do not be using this skill most of the time because you actually want to use the skill number three since it has delay. If he attacks before the enemy, it doesn't work because he actually wants to be hit by the indirect attack and get the chance to revenge and that only lasts for that particular turn so if he already made his action he's not going to chase now skill number two is called sword and shield dance that is a support self skill that is not fast that will grant the user this incitement mastery that buffs endurance and will by 20 percent on each Turn, he will also be giving him a taunt stance, medium effect, lasts for 4 turns, so it takes 4 turns for him to be on full potential of taunt, unlike his other version that takes only 2 turns. He will also buff his ailment resistance, that's helpful because he can actually be the last one standing, and he will lose buffs from other sources. He will also recover HP by around 300, so it's very useful to keep him well, and he will be buffing everyone, including himself, and being attacked as well. But now, the most interesting skill is Rising Pale Blade. Like I said, he wants to attack after the enemy, so this skill has delay, so he will always attack after everyone else. And it has Slash and Pierce as well, just as power. But it costs just 9, and it will also recover the user BP by 3. You should consider that, well, when he is landing an attack, he gets 1 BP meaning that you always have at least 4 BP per turn, and you recover 3 from this, so that's 8, and you spend 9, meaning that if you get hit by at least one indirect attack in a turn, you always have enough to use this skill. The damage block is nice because it has no turn limit, meaning that on the next turn you can block one hit, or if you are attacking an enemy that counters, well, 
the counter will not have any effect versus Julian. That's interesting because this is how he negates the counter damage from Kazinsi on stage 240. Now, this Julian is pretty much different than the other version of himself. Because the other Julian actually has a much different design. He buffs STR when he is hit, and he wants to be directly hit. His taunt is much better, because he has many different effects, like he has taunt for two turns, has a small effect, it's slower, but then he puts all other surviving allies into stealth, reducing each one of them chance to be targeted by a volley. This also lasts for two turns, meaning that on turn two, Julian already has a very, very high chance of being targeted. But he likes to be hit from direct attacks, because he can counter those direct attacks all the time with Terry uh, Rush. That has between two to four hits, and if you get three hits, it's already three points power, and if you have four hits, it's four as power of damage, and each hit can buff many different stats. But they are used in different situations. Good thing is that Julian can also buff Surviving allies endurance when he is attacking. That can help you a lot versus physical fights. Julian is a party player that wants everyone to help him and he will help them back via buff. And also by decreasing the chance of them being attacked. But he is used versus physical types of enemies. While the newest Julian works for spell fights, where the enemies will be using spells or indirect skills. So he will also help the party, but this time with just cover instead of endurance buffs. His stout is a little inferior, but he still works pretty fine depending on enemy behavior. If an enemy attacks you at least three times with indirect attacks, I can tell you that Julian is a very nice character to have around, because that means that you have three chains attacks that have very similar power to triple S. And, in the end, he can be your main damage dealer, while also sometimes covering. I don't really believe that the cover mechanic is game-changing, like I said many times in the past, but when it triggers and saves someone, it's very incredible. Now, the thing is, this Julian can also give that second skill, call it uh, Sword and Shield Dance, to his past version, because that makes him even better because now he already has that two-turn taunt with stealth. He can inherit that skill, and now you have two taunts every turn alongside the stealth. So it will be very hard for any enemy to attack Julian if he's using the right formation. And both versions of himself want to use Rising Phoenix EX or Rising King EX, depending on the situations. If you still need Will, you want Rising Phoenix EX, and that's usually the most useful formation of the game anyway. Now, uh, this Julian here is also capable of inheriting, and it will be interesting to inherit Star Liberation because this will give him a 20% defense up to decrease damage taken even further, but only if you feel like you need. It comes from his passive style as well. But nothing else here will make much difference because, in the end, he just wants to keep using the same skill tree all the time. If you use something else, he may not uh, chase because he attack it before the enemy, and that's not something great. So this Julian works by himself, does not need any type of inheritance, it's not a must-have, he's actually a very strong damage dealer that can offer over mechanic, but if you don't have many gems, I would not recommend pulling on Julian, unless you already have Katarina and want to test your luck. The second style is Thomas, and he uses spears and also the earth element. He has just spells with this version, does have 103% STR, but that's for inheritance options. 90% endurance is much better than I expected, and 92% will keep him safe. But the combination of both agility and intelligence could be a little better since he is technically still just a mage. Now, moving forward, we have 30% damage increase at all times, alongside another 30 coming from Spear Finis. He also reduces damage taken at all times by 30%. When all allies are still surviving, he will increase damage potential for everyone by 15%. So, you have 60% if someone dies, but 75% most of the time. He then also gives everyone a screw guard, so that they will reduce damage taken by 20% if everyone is alive. Now, when attacking with spell attacks, he will grant himself a damage block, and he has only spells with this setup. 
Also, when landing an attack, he will recover 1 BP and will grant this target defense dial decreasing the defense by 10%, lasts for 2 turns and can stack. When landing an attack, he will always change this also with double heavy spear strike. That skill is S power only, pierce and blunt damage. Sadly, it could be stronger since we have many characters with stronger changes. So pretty much like Khalid, he has a mid-range chains attack, but has a chance of a very strong one. Here we have between 3 to 5 times, but it's just blunt damage and not piercing blood, so it kind of limits his elemental options a little. Moving forward, skill number 1 is a spell, rock, fall, single target, blunt and pierce again, and it has a chance to debuff the enemy intelligence by 15% on max rank. Can also stun, but stun is just for Kazinsi Remembrance for now, and a future Remembrance as well. It's a weak spell, and for the cost, it's just so that you don't use normal attack when you don't have too much BP. The second skill is called Life Rock Shield, and it will give him damage block for this turn so that he does not take damage. It will also create a passive where you can recover 2 BP when you are hit by a blunt attack, and that doesn't have any limit if the enemy uses like 5 AoE blunt attacks in the same turn, like Arsenal can do. You will recover 10 BP in that turn for your whole squad. Well, that's a very specific situation, and the enemy has to use a blunt attack. Well, in this game, we have eight types of elemental damage. So having an effect that works with just one of the eight, although physical types are pretty common, it's very restricted and this character will become more of a specialist. Then after casting this for this specific turn, he creates a passive that will allow you to have this from turn two onwards every single turn. Well, you should use this on the start of the fight because this really, really helps. Now, the third one is called a Grand Rock Wall. It's a single target attack with blunt and pierce damage that grants all surviving allies a guard up medium that decreases damage taken by 25%, a blunt defense boost that decreases blunt damage by 35%, and a pierce defense boost that decreases pierce damage by 35% too. If the enemy uses an attack that has both blunt and pierce, you're gonna stack those two effects so you have multiplicatively 35 and then another 35 and then another 25 because of the guard up. But all of the effects only last for that turn, meaning that Thomas wants to use this skill every single turn in order to have his full potential up. Well, the good thing is that he will chase with his uh, double heavy spear strike. This is actually a spear attack and not a spell. And then he still has a chance to chase with gravity rush, so his damage is not that bad. But, guard up, medium, defense, boost to two different elements is not that important. I can say that he's going to give you lots of VP, and if he gets hit by many blunt attacks, he can keep up using this skill. But then it's something like, you are doing blunt and pierce damage versus an enemy that uses blunt and pierce damage and protecting versus this. And this skill here is fast, meaning that at least he can come before the enemy, but if you don't have enough, you just have to use Rockfall, and that just debuffs intelligence. If you want to use Thomas more as of a damage dealer, you can inherit from his past style. This is a skill called White Lightning that can uh, debuff the enemy endurance by 30% and buff his own STR by 40 and then launches an attack that has pierce damage. Sadly, it's still very costly with 12 BP. And if you want to use him for spell damage, you can inherit Gravity Rush from another of his past premium styles. That is the same skill that he has a chance to chase. And it's blunt, so if the enemy is just weak to blunt, you can keep a full blunt cycle. And if you really want to debuff Agility, he has a skill, Hyper Gravity Plus, that can debuff Agility by 30%. Anything else is not that important, and if you want to debuff intelligence, just use this skill one since it's still cheap. But right now, only 15% debuff is not game changing. Thomas is a style that has some type of utility, but it's still very limited. And for the general player that just wants to summon for meta, to really be skipping this guy. I'll be giving him a 3 out of 5 in my new grand system because he's really hard to use. The next character is Sarah, and she has 117% tax rate with 75% endurance and 110% will. She has much better sustain versus magical attacks. Agility is 102%, actually a very nice volley. 
we have 30% damage increase aligned another 30% for 60% total, then she decreases damage taken by 30%. She also has heat ups with 20% each turn, reaching a max of 100% by turn 5. Alongside everything, she will have 160% up by turn 5. She's a 5 people turn character and starts the fight with 13. Now, you have a lot of different effects that depends on she having an energy charge stance that we'll be discussing in a few. Skill number one is a single target attack with C power 2 BP cost that buffs the user's dexterity and will by up to 25% on max level. Well, it's not that strong, but it's something that you can use for very cheap value, but she will not be using this if you are using Sierra correctly. The second skill is Spirit Flower plus a recovery skill that does not use LP and actually has a 5 limit per fight, recovers, revives, and gives an attack boost for the cost of 2 BP. You will not be using this if you are using Sarah correctly, because she just wants to use skill number 3, called Flower Circle Arrow. It's a single target attack with pierce and sun damage. Before attacking, she grants herself this attack boost that can increase damage potential by 30% lasts for 2 turns and a defense boost that increases damage taken by 25% lasts for 2 turns. Both the facts can stack. Then she launches an attack. The attack itself has 4S power. The skill costs 13 BP. And it deals good enough damage because the character has good damage potential. But she has no chase skill as you can see. Instead, she will then enter this energy charge stance that lasts for just this turn, and on the next turn, she will attack with it. But, on the start of the next turn, she is in the energy charge stance, she will grant this guard up very large that lasts for two turns to the squad. Decreasing damage taken by 50% does not stack with other sources of guard up, but if she enters an energy charge stance every two turns, she can protect the squad pretty well. But on turn 1, she does not have any damage reduction to the party. And that is not very helpful. She cannot be your only damage reduction specialist, but you never bring just one anyway. She then has a 50% chance to recover all surviving alliance HP by probably around 1.4 thousand. The thing about this is that since she is on an energy charged stance every two turns, 50% every two turns means that she will be healing once every four turns on the average. She grants herself this Morale Up Extreme that increases her damage potential by 50% so that her Chased Attack will do more damage. And she has also a 50% chance to recover 6 BP that again, she will be on an Energy Charge Stance every two turns and you have just 50% chance average value of 3. And that's exactly what she needs. Remember that she has 5 people per turn and she needs 13. Okay, so you start with 13, you use this skill, and then on the next turn, you hope that you get the extra 3, I mean, the extra 6, so that you will have enough BP to start turn 3 using Flower Circle Arrow again. But we usually have at least one BP battery in the squad. For example, Katarina will give her 2 BP if she's hit two times and resist an attack, so she will always have enough BP to keep running her cycle. If she's using uh, her skills alongside Hyrge as well, Jure, many other characters will just keep her afloat. But a skill that she uses during the charged stance is Unison Dancing Arrows. It's a single target attack that is also fast, meaning that she will go before anyone else. It hits for just Pierce, not Pierce and Sun, so she's mainly a Pierce damage dealer. Attacks random enemies, if there are multiple targets, not as good. With 2 to 4 hits. Well, each hit has B power, it's actually pretty strong, and grants all surviving allies, including herself, an attack boost that increases damage potential by 15% just for that turn alone with each attack. The damage is actually okay because of that Morale Up Extreme that increases 50% on two turns, so even her next cast can still do more damage off that third skill. So you have the attack boost and then the Morale Up Extreme to increase the power of a forest attack, but I really feel like she needed a chase attack as well. But the interesting thing about Sarah is to grant that guard up very large, she just clashes with who? Al Kaiser, that also has guard ups. Most of the characters will have defense boost, so it's not really hard to slot Sarah. But her damage is not really that impactful. And since she's locked into Pierce and not double element, it's 
well, a little less poly than some other characters that we got. For example, we have Shrawl that we got in recent times, and he actually offers more than Sarah, in my opinion, because Sarah healing is not reliable, and Shrawl can give you 5% endurance and will buff when you are hit, and he has insane damage because of his attack boost, 50% increase, that lasts for 5 turns, and he can chase when he is on overdrive. So he does have a lot of damage potential, especially if you have his Burning Descent skill. We got Z-Link that is still a little better party player than Sarah because she buffs STR and Dax when attacking. She can attack up to three times in a fight and her damage is even higher if she triggers her passives. So even Julian will be doing more damage if he's using it on the right situations. With other Pierce damage dealers coming up as well, Sarah's uh, selling point is to have the guard up very large and keep a lower damage output when comparing to real nukers. But, well, sustain is always welcome anyway. Not a single inheritance from her makes too much sense besides Peridot Dance, that if you don't have enough PP to use her skill tree, okay, use this one for free, you get at least 8 BP in the course of 4 turns, you have enough to keep running her skill number 3. Nonetheless, Sarah is still a very easy skippable character. Uh, the only selling point is being a bow user and giving that guard up alongside just okay damage. Well, Sarah is a little hard to slot, but she does have a generic guard up that will help versus any type of content, unlike Thomas, that can sometimes be way too hard to use because he relies on the enemy elemental type while Sarah doesn't. So I believe that she deserves a 3.5 in or new grading system. The last character is Ellen and she is a damage dealer but also the buffer with 120% STR, 102% agility because she wants to go fast and her intelligence is 90%. It may not be as high or some content if the enemies remove your buffs she will not be able to debuff via command but she has guaranteed debuffs as well her endurance is pretty bad just 71 and she's very fragile versus physical attacks but has 90 percent will that is a safe volley she starts the fight with 13 bp she has 20 percent damage increase for an passive and another 24 total of 40 percent damage increase she has 40 percent damage reduction when resisting to evade resisted attacks Besides when landing an attack, she recovers 1 BP, recovers around 250 HP, she will also buff her STR by 5% and also apply an attack boost to herself that increases damage potential by increasing damage potential by 10% lasts for 2 turns and stacks of course. Now, on the start of a turn, she has a 37% chance to trigger 3 different chain attacks. One is Morning Glory, the other one Deadly Spin, the third Reverse Delta Plus. We can check all of these attacks here. Morning Glory is one of the strongest pure 4S power attacks in the game and even has a chance to debuff the intelligence by 15%. It's also just pure slash damage. While Deadly Spin is slashing blunt, 4S power similar damage but without that debuff. And Reverse Delta Plus is single target as well, slashing blunt again. And before attacking, grants the user an attack boost that increases damage potential by 25%. Will stack with any other sources, lasts for two turns, and then unleashes a double S power attack that will feel much in line to a triple S one. And it will also make all the other attacks stronger. So, three very good skills to have as a chase. And those stances actually last for two turns, meaning that if it triggers, you get the effect on this turn and on the next. That's much better than in JP that you only had one trigger. But it's still 37% chance to have each one of those, meaning that starting from turn two onwards, you have the average of two chances without considering what exactly you get. It's still nice because all the attacks are strong when you consider this. Ellen can do very good damage. It will be buffed a little bit of STR and attack boost as well, and will get BP. When you consider that she has an average of two chances, she actually has around 6 BP generation per turn. If you have average luck, that is. 
Now, besides all of this, I left the best for last. When you start the fight, you get one stack of Secret of Gashing. This is a passive that when you land an attack, you can debuff the enemy, STR, Endurance, and Intelligence by 5%. That's a guaranteed debuff. STR and Intelligence, because this will decrease the damage from the enemy, save from dax rate based skills, and decreasing Endurance so that every new attack you perform will also increase your damage. Endurance debuff doesn't help much, but it's still there. Now, okay, if you consider that you have the average of two chases, you can debuff 15% guarantee from the start of the fight alone, but we have more than that. Now let's talk about skill number one. Power Disruptor is a single target attack with just slash damage, that when the attack lands, there is a chance to debuff the enemy's STR by 15%. Remember that the intelligence is not that high, because this is just a chance, it may fail depending on the situations. But if the attack lands, you at least grant a Morale Downs mount that increases the damage on the source by 15%, lasts for 2 turns. For 2 BP, that's really not bad, since it has C power. The second skill is called Loop Wheel. It's a full AoE attack, just slash damage again, with 5 EP cost and the power. Damage is pretty bad, but when the attack lands, there is a chance to debuff the enemy's intelligence by 20% on max level. Again, she may not have enough intelligence, but when you consider that you can still chase and have all the other debuffs, it's interesting if you are after debuffing intelligence instead of debuffing STR. And it's AoE. Then we have the third skill, Dynamic Gash. That is actually pretty interesting. It costs a lot, 13, but she starts with 13. It is Slash and Blunt, so she can actually do very good damage versus enemies that are weak to Blunt since just one of her changes are Slash. Then, before attacking, she grants herself one another stack of Secret of Gashing, the same one that she starts to fight with. That means that when you start the fight and you use Dynamic Gash, you double the effects of Secret of Gashing. So instead of debuffing 5% for each status, you'll be debuffing 10%. Okay, on the start of a fight, turn 1, you have just the average of 1 chains. That means that you will debuff at least 20% on the average levels, but RNG can still fail. And on the second turn, if you have enough BP and use Dynamic Gash again, you can now triple the effects. And that will mean you have a 15% debuff to those three status with each hit. If you don't have enough BP, you will at least have the average of three hits and you already have double the effects and you can debuff at least on the average of 30%, but if you have two stacks of Dynamic Gash, you can debuff as much as 45%. And if you happen to still have BP by turn 3 and use another Dynamic Gash, you will then have 4 times the Volus. 4 times the Volus is kind of crazy, because now you have a 20% debuff by each attack. That means that you can reach the average of 60% or higher or lower. See where I'm getting if Ellen is used together with very good BP generators like Harji that in my opinion usually tends to be the best one for general usage. You have a lot of debuffs but you still have to rely on Ellen's agility. Well, if you don't have Harji, well, you can still use Shirei. Or and use Monica, that will instead decrease the BP cost of the skill. Or, if you want to use Specialist, you can use Thomas for Blunt, you can use Candy for Skills, you can use Asper Gal for Spells, and all of these characters can also work. Now, there is still a little bit of a problem with Ellen. She is reliant on RNG. You can still pay you to debuff the enemy. And sometimes that can lead to big, big problems. So I believe that Ellen is useful if she is being a multi-role specialist. 
a damage dealer, but also sometimes a debuffer. That can lead to an enemy doing zero damage if you have good RNG, but if you have bad RNG, she can also lead to a failure if she is your only debuffer. Hence why I believe she needs a companion as a debuffer as well. When using the right squads, Ellen can shine and will actually help a lot if you can keep up debuffing. And remember that you can still use Morale Down small if you don't have enough BP to use Dynamic Gash again. And uh, she will have at least 6 BP on the average. You may also still prefer to use a normal attack if you want to save more, depending on the BP battery you have access to. There's still another way to use Ellen if you have her latest style, this one. She has Garnet Dance. That is a support skill that gives you Shin Attack that you will trigger when you attack YoYo Plus that hits two times and buffs STR. Uh, you also recover 4 BP for free. This lasts for four turns, but if you use Garnet Dance, well, okay, she will be chasing and she will get extra BP. She will do enough damage, but you are skipping a turn and this character gets BP by attacking already. He heals, he buffs, by attacking. So if you're not attacking, she's also not debuffing. Meaning that she's not on full potential. It does work if you want to use this, if you want to save a special turn to do a lot of damage, but then she's just a full-time damage dealer. And the best inheritance, in my opinion, will come from this other version of Ellen that has a skill called Saturn Blade that spends 12 BP to give her a permanent end of turn recovery. You can use this skill five times per battle. But again, this makes her just a better damage dealer overall, because she would take a lot of time to build up and use Saturn Blade. Maybe in the end, you still just need a very good BP generator to keep Ellen using her skill tree as much as possible. Well, in the end, Ellen is nice and all, but still compares herself to Paulus. Paulus is a little more stable, actually much more stable, because he allows everyone in your party to be a debuffer for two different types. You can go for debuffing SDR and Endurance or Intelligence and Will. Each character can trigger two times a 5% debuff, meaning that you can get as much as 10% with each character. Well, you don't use characters that have chase in all your slots, so Reaching the max potential is not always possible, but even then, since this is spread it out, Paulus still can allow the party to reach very good potential. His damage is also nice, he has two different skills that he can chase with, but they have 50% chance to trigger only. His full damage will be lower than Ellen, but his debuffs are more consistent because he has a skill that debuffs and his intelligence is, um, I don't know if higher or lower. But the skills themselves debuffs more. Yeah, same. In the end, if you have Paulus, you don't need Ellen. And you have Xiao for AoE. But Ellen just does more damage than these other options. She is a hybrid, a damage dealer, but also debuffer. I think she deserves a 4 out of 5. She has similar value when compared to Julian. For some accounts, you may prefer one or the other, but still somewhat easy to skip if you want to pull for Katarina and don't have enough chance to summon for anyone else. Now, back to the banner image. Is this banner worth summoning for? Well, yes, but the value is a little more on the mid. I will be giving this banner a silver award because I really like Juden and Ellen in a way, but they are not meta characters. They are not must-haves. They are good to use on specific formations, they still need good party composition, and Thomas and Sarah are a little harder to slot and they won't offer too much moving forward. So it is a banner that you can easily skip if you want to pull for Katarina and wait for future banners that will have a bigger impact. But that's all my opinion, what is yours? Please say here on the comment section, thank you so much. For watching, and if you want to support the channel, there are links in the description. I hope to see you soon on the next one. Goodbye.